Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Preedy. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the accounting for admissions trading schemes. And to help me through that, he's back with me again. Welcome back, Scott Vandura. Thank you. Hello. Um, and we obviously, we recently caught up, didn't we, about climate change and climate risk and how that impacts financial and non-financial reporting. So slightly similar. So today, though, we're going to be talking specifically about emissions trading schemes and how difficult it is to account for them. So we love a bit of difficult accounting and you're going to make it nice and simple for us, Scott. That's the plan. Is That's okay? the plan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, could you give us a little bit of background on emissions trading schemes? Sure. Well, emissions trading schemes vary around the world. One of the largest schemes is in the European Union, but other schemes exist in various countries and sometimes even vary within a country between states or provinces, for example, in, in the United States and Canada. Most of these schemes cover carbon dioxide emissions, although some are trying to cover other types of emissions as well. But the fundamental purpose is generally to encourage reductions in emissions through incentivizing companies that engage in carbon neutral or carbon sequestering activities and stimulating investments in those businesses. Some businesses may be more carbon intensive, but the aim is to effectively offset such emissions by reducing the emissions to the extent possible in other businesses or promoting activities that otherwise offset emissions. Talking about the European Union Emissions Trading System, or ETS, this works on the cap and trade principle. So a cap is set on the total amount of certain greenhouse gases that can be emitted by installations covered by the system, and the cap is reduced over time so that emissions fall. Within the cap, a company receives or buys emission allowances, which they can trade with one another as needed. A limit on the total number of allowances available ensures that they have a value. And then each year, a company must surrender enough allowances to cover all of its emissions. Otherwise, uh, penalties are imposed. If a company reduces its emissions, it can keep the spare allowances to cover its future needs, or else sell them to another company that's short of allowances. Amazing. So there there are allowances that allow you, I suppose, a quota of mm -hmm. carbon emission and you can buy and sell those. That's um, right. OK, That's... so it's it's been around for a while. So it's been around since 2005. Why are we discussing it today? Has something changed? Well, dare I say, it's becoming a hot topic again for a couple of reasons. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> I used the same pun in the in the previous podcast. So. I remember. Um, Don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so it is it is becoming a point of discussion for a lot of companies for a few reasons. The first being that the price of the carbon credits has generally been increasing around the world, so such programs are becoming more material to companies. Results for both both those that need to purchase credits and those that are generating credits to sell as part of their business activities. For example, in July of this year, the, the price of EU credits reached its 14-year high, soaring above 30 euros a ton, and prices in other schemes are also fairly high. This is partly because, as we discussed, targets are becoming more stringent over time. Secondly, more businesses are getting involved in generating carbon credits, Some for have, have, for example, sought to diversify their energy mix. So we've seen many conventional energy companies expanding into solar or wind or investing in carbon capture technologies. The impact of carbon emissions trading is becoming increasingly critical in the economics of various businesses and investment decisions that are being made. Furthermore, many entities are focused on reporting carbon emissions as part of their ESG disclosures and are working towards their own carbon targets. In some cases, the carbon credits generated by such decisions are helping to defray the cost of these initiatives. Now, as far as I'm aware, there isn't an accounting standard in this area, as I randomly flick through my IFRS book on an ongoing basis. <laughs> We used to have IFRIC 3, but again, back in 2005, that actually the ISB withdrew it. Is there anything now? <laughs> 
That's right. Yeah, IFRA 3 was a, a short-lived standard that was subsequently withdrawn. The ISB did take undertake some research after the withdrawal of, of IFRA 3, and this morphed into a potential research project on pollutant pricing mechanisms. The initial research that the ISB performed investigated the common economic characteristics of a variety of pollutant pricing mechanisms and the accounting policies currently used to report them in the financial statements. The research had identified complex conceptual questions about the nature of the obligations arising from these mechanisms, particularly when the entity receives emissions allowances from, for no monetary consideration. The research also identified questions about whether and if so how to recognize assets and liabilities arising from such mechanisms. And some of those questions raise similar issues to those arising from IFRIC 21 levies, the levies standard. Following the feedback from the 2015 agenda consultation and a review of the research findings so far, the board moved this project from the active research program to the research pipeline to allow it to focus on higher priority projects. So the last time it was really discussed officially was in 2016. However, the ISB recently met in in October of 2020 to discuss its agenda consultation to gather feedback on where the ISB should focus its resources over the next five years. And one of the topics that the ISB will again ask for feedback on in this consultation is pollutant pricing. So entities that have an interest in this area may want to consider responding to the agenda consultation when it's released in the first half of 2021 for comment. Brilliant. So another comment letter for people to write in then on the the agenda consultation and looking out for pollutant pricing mechanisms there. So if there's no accounting guidance, which there isn't for now and there won't be for maybe a little while, what should companies do? Well, the withdrawal of IFRIC 3 means that under the hierarchy for selecting accounting policies in IES 8, other accounting models are acceptable. IES 8 states that in the absence of a standard or interpretation that specifically applies to a transaction or other event or condition, management should use its judgment in developing an accounting policy that results in information that is relevant to the economic decision-making needs of users and reliable in that the financial statement should represent faithfully the financial position, financial performance, and cash flows of the entity, reflect the economic substance of transactions, be neutral and free from bias, be prudent, and be complete in all material respects. So the absence of specific guidance means there's significant diversity in the selection of accounting policies for these schemes. In 2007, we published a a result of a survey conducted together with the International Emissions Trading Association, AITA, with a very punny title called Trouble Entry Accounting Revisited, which I think reflects the difficult judgments that need to be made in accounting for such schemes. It's been more than 10 years since we published that survey, and we are actually again working with AIDA to survey companies on their practices with respect to the accounting for emissions and plan to publish the results of the survey in 2021. However, unfortunately, our initial results from the survey don't seem to show much reduction in the diversity in practice in accounting for such schemes over the past decade. Trouble entry accounting. That is masterful, Scott. So (laughs) whoever came up with that, that must have taken hours of wizardry. I love it. (laughs) So maybe let's get into some of you. So there's diversity in practice. Let's maybe come talk about some of the common approaches. Earlier, when we talked about these allowance, you talked about, you know, allowances that are granted to an entity, but you can also purchase allowances. How are those, how, how are both of those initially recognised on the balance sheet? Well, in many schemes, granted allowances are essentially received without the payment of any direct monetary consideration, and some have considered these to be within the scope of IS-20, the government grant standard, and record them at market value at the date of grant, whereas others recognize the grants at cost, which means they essentially measure them at nil for granted allowances. For purchased allowances, on the other hand, most treat the initial recognition at cost, which is the amount paid for such allowances, but the nature of the asset that companies record varies. For example, we've observed some treat as intan- some treat these as intangibles, 
some as inventory or uh, some other form of asset. Okay, so in some cases, you recognize an asset at cost on day one. What's the subsequent accounting treatment for that? Again, it, it varies based on our previous survey, only a minority of companies recognize depreciation relating to such allowances. We did find some entities revaluing the allowances post recognition, but the majority recognized the allowances at cost. This might vary though between how the entity is using the allowances, for example, whether they consider themselves to be a broker trader in such allowances versus using them for compliance purposes. So how is the obligation for admissions valued? Well, for those entities that are engaged in carbon producing activities, there's an obligation incurred as emissions are generated. Some still analogize to the withdrawn IFRIC 3 approach and would measure the liability at the full market value of the credits required to settle the allowance each period, regardless of whether any emissions allowances are held. However, entities that don't apply this IFRIC 3 approach generally either net the liability with the emissions credits on hand for example, only recognize a liability for emissions in excess of the emission allowances held, or they don't offset the liability with the credits held, but measure a part of the liability for the emissions credits on hand at the carrying amount of the uh, credits held and the excess of the emissions obligation at the market value of the emissions cost. So this all sounds quite tricky. And like we've, we've said, it's definitely diversity in practice and you mentioned trouble entry survey was back in 2007 have we got any other guidance out there if people are listening to this and thinking well i really don't know how to account for these things well even though the trouble entry accounting survey is old it still has some relevant guidance on the accounting we saw back then as i mentioned we are working on a revised version of the survey which will be comprehensively updated with the latest statistics on the accounting and hopefully you'll see that early in 2021. As mentioned, I would also encourage entities to monitor the ISB's agenda consultation project and comment on that if they feel the ISB should be prioritizing the development of guidance in this area. Overall, though, I, I would say this is a, a really complex area and entities should ensure they've thought about and understood the accounting for these emissions programs and the related emissions obligations, especially as they become more material to the entity. And furthermore, because of the diversity in accounting for these credits, multinational entities will want to ensure that their accounting policies are consistent across the group for consistent schemes and sometimes might even need to consider whether their associates and joint ventures are also applying consistent accounting policies. And nice, clear disclosure on those policies, I should think, will also be useful. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Okay, brilliant, Scott. Thank you very much. So trouble entry survey, still really relevant, but we are going to update it in 2021 and that will be available on the new viewpoint site. So look out for that um, early into the new year. Um, and as Scott said, also look out on the ISB's website for when they bring out the agenda consultation, if you feel strongly that they should address this error and bring out some guidance. Thank you very much, Scott, for coming back with us again. I promise to leave you alone for a little bit because I keep asking you to come back to the recording studio. And thank you to our listeners. Stay safe and happy accounting. The preceding programme was brought to you by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.